We want to. We're just here to minister to you, and we want to tell you a little bit about um, what we do and what we are currently involved in. So, we have a ministry called Encounter Heart to Heart, and after 35 years of being pastoring in local church, beginning here in Barnstable, where Paul was ordained, God took us to Bournemouth. And then he took us to Amersham for 16 years. And during a sabbatical in 2019, God spoke to us very, very clearly. He spoke through the prophetic word in many occasions. He spoke through dreams uh, from people in different parts of the country. Somebody painted us uh, a prophetic painting. And God clearly said to us, I want you to minister to the local church. And, wider. sorry? Wider. The wider church, sorry. <laughs> the wider church. I'm totally unprepared for this. And um, so it was a bit like one person had a, um, a prophetic word for us and they said they could see us going on a zip wire, a dual zip wire. And uh, it was a very, you know, started off very high and then it took us all over the place, this zip wire. And that's definitely what it's felt like. We're on this adventure and we don't know where God's going to take us. When we first started an encounter heart to heart, which is the, the name of, that God gave us, he said, I want you to bring the, my father heart my, to the heart of the people, to encounter the heart of the people. And so he gave us this encounter heart to heart, the title. And so we began our adventure in 2019, and then lockdown came. So that was really interesting. We left our, both our salaries and teaching and, and the pastorate, and uh, then suddenly we're living by faith, and it came to lockdown. But God is good, and we've never, ever been in the red, not mm -hmm. even during lockdown. And it was amazing, God's provision for us. So we, this, this is what we do. We bring God's heart to his people and to those that aren't his people that they might encounter him. So I'd like to pray for Paul before he starts and brings God's word. So Father God, I, I thank you. This is the day that you have made. And I thank you for every single person that is here as part of your church today, Lord. I bless them in Jesus' name, and I pray for every single person here, Lord God, that you would come and they would encounter you mm. in a wonderful way by your Spirit. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would give us all responsive hearts to whatever you want to say to us this morning. And I pray for Paul, Lord. I thank you for the message that you have given him for this morning, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would... Uh, use him mightily. You would give him freedom in this place to bring whatever is on your heart for your people. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. You are an amazing God. You're a wonderful Father. Mm. And we love you, Lord. And we want to honor and glorify your holy name today. Amen. Amen. Bless you, Liz. Well, good morning, Grosvenor. It's great to be with you this weekend. We had an absolutely blast all day yesterday. We're here from nine o'clock. We didn't get away till after five because so many people came forward for prayer and ministry, which was a great pleasure and privilege for Liz and I. As Liz said, we travel all over the UK. We do church weekends. We do leadership training, marriage enrichments. We cover all subjects. And a question that I'm asked time and time again from pastors is this. As you go around the church and the nation, what do you perceive is the greatest need of the church at this moment in time? And one could respond, well, we need to see more signs and wonders. We need to see more of the miraculous. One could say we need to see more extravagant worship. Or we need to see more initiatives in mission. One could be tempted even to say that we need more strong Bible teaching. And all four would be probably true in different areas. 
But my response to that question, I believe that the greatest need of the church today in this nation is the need of encouragement. And so this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject, the power of encouragement. And Paul was a a great encourager. It was a key factor in his ministry. He inspired people to grow and to mature and reach their full potential in God. Paul was a great encourager to the church at Thessalonica. It was founded in his second missionary journey in AD 51. And Paul encouraged this church in three different ways. And I want to say to you this morning, if we cultivate them within this church family, we will be stronger, we will be more vibrant, we will be more effective for God and for his kingdom. The first way he encouraged them was this. He sent them a letter. Now this is AD 51, so there was no royal mail, there was no phones, no emails, no texts, uh, no WhatsApps, no Instagram, no Twitter. Just the good old pen and paper sent by a messenger. But Paul's heart and burden is so much for the church in Thessalonica, he takes time to write them a letter. And as you read this letter, there are two main reasons why Paul wrote to this church. First of all, he wanted to express his unconditional love for them. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our very lives as well. Paul says, we loved you so much. The literal translation in the Greek says this, we couldn't love you anymore. Paul expresses his unconditional love for this church. Paul says, God has lavished his love upon me and so I long to lavish my love upon you. And that inspired them, that encouraged them to go on. Receiving and listening to this letter enthused them in their walk with God. And I'm assured of this. They read this letter again and again and again so that they would be inspired to run the race for God. I want to say to you this morning, never underestimate the impact of a letter, a card, a text, a WhatsApp or an Instagram message. Let me give you some illustration of this. When our eldest daughter Pauline went to university, In her first week, I felt prompted by God to send her a card expressing how much I loved her, giving her a little Bible verse, putting in a bit of money for a pizza or a little treat. And so I sent it off. The next week, I felt the same prompting from God. And it lasted a whole year. Every week, sent a card, little note, Bible verse, five pound, have a treat. She was clearing her room out for her wedding day and there was a box, a shoe box on the bed and she said to me, Pops, do you know what's in there? No idea. Love letters from Leon, your husband to be? No, no, no. Open it up, Pops opened up the box and every card I'd ever sent her at university was in this box. She said to me, Pops, you have no idea what those cards meant to me. She says, when the going was tough and I felt like throwing in the towel and coming home, I would read your cards and I would read the Bible verses that you wrote in them And it saw me through my first year at university and beyond. As Liz said, 
I was ordained in Old Grosvenor Church in 1986. And then God called us to Bournemouth in 1991. And it was such a wrench for, for Liz and I to leave Grosvenor Church and to leave Graham and Maureen especially. And when we went to Bournemouth, we received a phone call. We received a letter. We received a gift like a bunch of flowers. We received a visit for every week for the first year. Unbelievable. As people expressed their love for us. I went home from a church one Sunday and we were at the lunch table and I noticed this text. And it was from a man in the church. And I looked at it and he said, Paul, that was an awesome sermon. And I love what you give and I love who you are. And I said to Liz, look at that. Isn't that encouraging? And when I looked at it, he sent it at 25 to 12. I was only halfway through my sermon. <laughs> and he took the time to text and encourage me. I love the story of David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel 18 where we read that Jonathan loved David as himself and David loved Jonathan. And they declared and expressed and demonstrated that practical love. Jesus uh, in John 13 says that the hallmark of Christianity to those that don't know Christ, the hallmark of discipleship is the demonstration of our love for one another. So just maybe, just maybe this morning somebody's waiting for a text. They're waiting for a card. They're waiting for a, an email or a letter to encourage them, to inspire them in the fact that not only does God love them, but you love them too. Second reason for writing this letter was to give them spiritual insight. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. There was some confusion about the resurrection and those who died in Christ. There was confusion about the rapture of the church and the second coming. So Paul takes this opportunity to speak truth and revelation and insight into the situation. And in so doing, he inspires them. He encourages them to look into the future with great expectation that the best is yet to come. And their hearts were open. Their hearts were hungry. Their hearts were receptive to receive Paul's insight and wisdom. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been walking with God for 43 years and I still need a Paul in my life. I need somebody to speak into my life with great wisdom and insight and, and foresight to encourage me to be effective for God. I want to be hungry. I want to be open for God to speak through someone else. But I just don't want a Paul. I want to be a Paul. I want to be a Paul to other people. I want to speak truth and I want to bring revelation that will inspire and encourage people in their walk with God. We need to unconditionally love each other. And we need to speak truth and revelation into each other's life so that we'll be all that God has called us to be. That's why he wrote. Second way Paul expressed and encouraged the church was he sent a helper. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 1 to 5. So when I could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens, and we sent Timothy 
who is her brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in the faith so that no one be, would be unsettled by these trials. In fact, when you were with me, we kept telling you that we and you would be persecuted. And it turned out the way, as you well know, and for this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. For I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labours might have been in vain. Do you feel the, the passion and, and the desperation and, and the pain within Paul's heart? He said, when I could stand it no longer, his, his love and his concern for the church has almost overwhelmed him. And so he sends Timothy. Now, I believe that Timothy it was Paul's closest companion. Because when he sent Timothy to the church at Philippi, this is what he says of Timothy. He says, there is nobody like Timothy. Timothy is a one-off. Timothy is the best of the best. That's who I'm sending. Now, Timothy's ministry was threefold. First of all, he to strengthen them in the faith. The word strengthen in the Greek, it means to support. It means to make strong something that is weak. And I can't begin to imagine how they felt when they saw Timothy. It must have been such an encouragement to them. Now we don't know what Timothy did or what Timothy says but he did what Paul asked him to do and he strengthened them. One of my favourite stories in scripture is David and Jonathan. And uh, in 1 Samuel uh, 23, we have a situation where David's on the run from Saul. Saul's going to kill him and he's frightened and he's on the run from Saul and he finds himself in this field and he's depressed and he's disappointed, he's discouraged. He doesn't know what's happening to him. And we read this lovely verse in Samuel 23 that Jonathan went to Horish and he found David in the field and he helped him find Strength in God. We're not told how he did it. Did he hug him? Did he give him a Brazilian kiss? <laughs> did he remind him of the prophetic promises that were spoke over his life? We're not sure. But we're assured of this. He helped him find strength in God. Several years ago, our uh, youngest daughter, uh, she was seriously ill in Southampton Hospital and an operation went wrong and it was one of the darkest days of my life when I saw Hannah in so much pain and I'm weak and I feel helpless because of the situation. You know that as parents, if you could take the pain, you take the pain and you're looking there and you feel so helpless and hopeless. And I'm standing looking at Hannah and the door opens and it's my best friend, Harry Gillick. And he's travelled from Barnstable to Southampton to help me find strength in God. And we stand and we hug together and he prayed for me and he prayed for Hannah and over Hannah. And he helped me find strength in God. My strength was renewed in him. When the going gets tough, we're here to strengthen each other in our faith. Secondly, he stands with them in the trial. Verses three and four. Paul had warned them about the hardship. He warned them about the persecution that would come. He said, when I leave you, your faith will be tried and tested. And Paul hears how severe the trials are. And so he sends Timothy. He sends Timothy to step into the world 
to step into their suffering, to step into their pain and encourage them in the trials. Timothy, he wants them to fix their eyes on Jesus, who's the author and the perfecter of their faith, so that they will not grow weary and lose heart. So that they will not grow weary and throw in the towel. He's there to step into their world. It's not easy to keep going when the going gets tough. And sometimes we need a Timothy to step into our lives when the going gets tough. I had a good friend who died two years ago very suddenly. Lovely pastor, built up an amazing church and we used to meet up on a regular basis. He was only 62. And when I used to phone Gordon to meet up, the joke was he was always eating a bacon butty. And the first thing I said to him was, put down the bacon butty, we need to talk. Okay, bacon butty down. 2002, God in his wisdom called our youngest daughter Hannah home to be with him. She was only 17 and a half. And her great loss was heaven's gain. And I can't begin to tell you the grief and the sadness and the sorrow that that brought to Liz and I and the family. The night after Hannah died, there there was a, a knock at the door and I went to open the door and Who's standing there but Gordon? And he's got a packet of bacon. And he's got six rolls. And I said to him, why didn't you just phone? He says, the phone doesn't hug. And it doesn't taste like a bacon roll. (laughs) And so he came in. He stepped into my grief. He stepped into my pain and my suffering and he strengthened my faith in God. Timothy was a man who stepped in when others walked away. And I want to encourage you today to take every opportunity, not just to stand with those whose faith has been tried and tested, but actually to step in to their pain and to their suffering in order that their faith might be strengthened. Thirdly, he had to reaffirm that they're in a spiritual battle. Verse five, Paul says, I was afraid, oh, I was so afraid that that the enemy might have tempted you to throw in the towel, to to turn back to your idols, to to stop running the race and and to live a, a mediocre Christian life. You know, the enemy will use anyone and any circumstances to question our faith, to rob, steal and destroy that which God has given to us. I know you know this, but I'm going to remind you. This nation is littered, littered with prodigals up and down the country. Thousands of prodigals. Men and women who pledge their allegiance to Christ. But in this spiritual battle, they were taken out. They were derailed. Remember what Paul said to the church in Galatia? Who's bewitched you? What's happened to you? You were, you were doing so well. But look at you now. In 1978, I had the privilege of leading my brother to the Lord. I was the youngest of 10, Roman Catholic family. And I led my brother to the Lord. It was a highlight of the year. But sadly, when we moved to England, he became a prodigal. And for 40 years, Liz and I have been praying for him. Almost daily, I've sent him cards and texts. I love you, God loves you, I'm praying for you. On a regular basis, I pray Isaiah. I say to the north and the south, the east and the west, you give them up. Let the sons and the daughters come back. Let them come home. 
Nine months ago, I got a text. Hi, bro. I want you to know your prayers are answered. And I've come home. Come home. In the past nine months, I tell you, the father has given him the years that the locusts have eaten. And he's on a fast track with God. He's so hungry and so desperate for God. It's inspirational. We're in this spiritual realm. And Timothy would have reminded them, your fight is not against flesh and blood and against the prince. Sorry, your fight is not against each other, but it's against the principalities and the spiritual wickedness of this dark, evil age. And we need to be aware of that spiritual battle and we need to be alert to the tactics of the enemy and we need to stand together as we fight the good fight. And God will send the right person at the right time to strengthen your faith, to stand with you when the going gets tough and speak against the spiritual darkness over your life. Thirdly, Paul encouraged the church by praying for them. Paul was a prayer warrior and he'd seen incredible answers to prayer. And in his prayer for this church, he covers four areas. First of all, he prays for their faith. Verse 10 of chapter 3. Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again, supplying what is lacking in your faith. The word earnestly here means intensely. We pray for you without wavering, without ceasing. Paul says, I pray for you day and night. He wanted their faith to lack nothing. He wanted them to be complete and to be strong and bold in the face of opposition and persecution. And I find it extremely encouraging when I'm going through a difficult time when I receive a text or a card or an email or a phone call. As I shared yesterday, uh, Liz and I are in a storm at the moment. Uh, just over two weeks ago, I was diagnosed of having skin cancer. And I just went for a general check up on an operation I'd done and they shared that news that I'm sorry we got it wrong but you've got cancer and this is what you'll need to do you'll need to go back into a hospital you need an operation you'll need more of your arm taken away then we need to put radioactive dye into your system then we need to take some lymph nodes away and we need to test them to see if they've gone elsewhere When we heard that news, we went back to the car and we prayed together. And I was reminded of that song. I'm going to sing in the middle of this storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise because death has been defeated and the king is arise. And despite what I hear, And despite what I see, that praise will arise. But it's so encouraging when they go and get stuff that you receive a text and you receive an email to say, I don't know why, but I'm praying for you. And God's timing is always perfect. It's such an encouragement to know that people are praying for you. But you know, the greatest encouragement, Jesus is praying for me. He's like, I see you, Paul. Oh, it's a bit of a storm you're in. Those winds are fierce. Look at the size of those waves. But I'm praying for you. I'm praying that your faith will remain strong. Secondly, he prays for the love. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. Paul wants their love to increase and overflow. They were loving and they were a caring church but there was still more to give. 
And we need to be more creative. We, we need to be more expressive, I believe, with our love as Christians. I'm 64, almost going on 65. And when I was 60, Liz said to me, I'm going to take you on a holiday to celebrate your 60th. I said, great. So we went to the airport and Liz said to me, uh, you go and have breakfast and I'm just going to buy something. And she went away and I had a big full monte. I'm on holiday. Whoa, 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 great. She comes back with this little gift bag and she said, this is for you. And then she said something extraordinary. She said to me, this is the first gift of 60 gifts for your 60th. And I went, whoa. I instantly regretted it. She instantly regretted it, but it was written in heaven. <laughs> and so I opened up this bag and it was my favorite aftershave, Joe Malone. I was like, wow. And thereafter, for a whole year, she gave me these surprises, these gifts. They weren't all Joe Malone. She cleaned my car out one day, which I was grateful for. That's a great gift. But every time she, she gave a gift, it was an expression of her love for me as her husband. And I believe that God longs to bring that creativity within the church not just within a marriage, that we should be creative in how we express our love for each other. The love that God has lavished upon us, we should do that for each other. Thirdly, he prays for their lifestyle. May he strengthen you, chapter 3, verse 13, may he strengthen your heart so that you'll be blameless and holy in his presence, in the presence of our God, the Father, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes with all his holy ones. In chapter one, he says to them, you know what? You are a role model for all the churches in Macedonia. And Paul prays that they'll be kept blameless. The phrase means without accusation. No one to point the finger. Paul wants the church to be ready for the Lord's return. He says, it will happen. It'll be in a moment. It'll be a trumpet sound. And the Lord will come back. And Paul says, don't be ashamed of his coming. Be faithful in your lifestyle. Do not conform any longer to this world. But be transformed by the Spirit of God. And be a role model for others to follow. Peter says, but you know what you are. You need to live it. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a special possession of God's that you may declare the praises of him who's called you out of, his dark, out of darkness into his wonderful light. We have to be distinctive in our lifestyle. And we're called to be a role model. And Paul prays for that. And we pray that for each other. And finally, Paul prays for the prophetic voice. He says, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecy with contempt. But test them all. And hold on to what is good. And reject all kinds of evil. Paul knew the importance of hearing the prophetic voice of God. And he wanted the church to, to step out, not only on the word of God, but the prophetic voice of God for this time and this season. And I believe that there is a calling upon this church, upon each individual within this church, to hear the voice of God and to hear the prophetic voice of God for your life and for your ministry but for the church and the community don't quench the spirit Paul says but let him have his way I so want to encourage you today in order that you might be an encourager I so want to bless you today in order that you might be a blessing 
I still want you to reach your full potential in Christ today so that that community might know the reality of our God and come to him. Let's just pray. There's just a few things the Lord has laid in my heart. You know, sometimes we, we think, you know, after the service, I, I'm going to text someone and I'm going to email someone. I'm going to send them a card. And uh, I'm just going to tell them that, you know, I love them, that I'm praying for them and I appreciate them. You know, sometimes preachers, they kind of frown when they see people on their phone and they think the best and think they're on their Bible app, but they're probably not. But do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you permission right now as we close this service. If God has laid somebody in your heart, pick up your phone. Pick up your phone and text them. Tell them you're thinking of them. Tell them that you love them. Tell them that you're praying for them. Tell them that you appreciate them. Right at this moment, before we worship, or even as part of your worship, tell someone. Some of us may find ourselves in that storm. And uh, it's pretty choppy. The news that you've received recently is not good. Your situation's not good. And the waves are high and the winds are fierce. We'd love to pray for you today. And we'd love to speak peace into your situation. Jesus said three words, quiet, be still. And it was done. Because I want your praise to rise in the middle of the storm. And I want hope to rise within. You know, sometimes we pray for folk to receive hope. I think hope's within. Sometimes we, receive, we pray for people to receive more of the Spirit. I, I'm more keen to call up the Spirit that's within. You know, streams of living water that brings hope and, and joy and, and healing. So if you're in that storm today, we, we just want to stand with you. We want to step in. And we want to stand together, Liz and I, in the leadership of this church. But maybe you have a prodigal brother, member of your family, and you know in your heart you've not fought for them. Why not start today? Why not stand with somebody else who's got a prodigal here at the front and declare, I say to the north and the south, the east and the west, you give them up. You send the sons and the daughters home because they belong in the Father's house. You can do that together. You can do that today. We can stand together for the prodigals. Or maybe you just need to go and find somebody in the church who's been a Jonathan to you, who's encouraged you and inspired you to, to run when the race was tough. You've seen something in them that has inspired you to go on. Then even as we worship, find that individual in the body and just bless them and encourage them. So would you stand as we pray together? When um, Paul was speaking and he was talking about when he, just before he got the news about his cancer, um, I was outside and, uh, and I just put my hand on my heart and I said, I choose peace. Today, I choose peace. And when I walked in to see the consultant with Paul and he told us the bad news, I just felt God's peace. I felt that overwhelming sense of his peace. And, and I feel today that you have choices to make. You have choices to make whether you're going to choose anxiety or you're going to choose peace from a father that loves you. You choose to be an encourager or you choose to be a discourager because I believe it's either or. You can just not bother 
Or you can choose to show love. Or you can choose to turn your back. You can choose to step in to the situation. Or you can choose to walk away. When we were in our worst moments, we had both. We had people that crossed the road that couldn't even look at us. But we had people that came and hugged us and cried with us. And you can choose that today. You can choose what you are going to be in your church and out with this church. So Lord, I want to pray for these beautiful people today. I thank you for them, Lord. I thank you for your body. I thank you that you love your body. You love the body of Christ, Father God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come now and you would help people to make really good choices today. Choices that are going to bless your name. Choices that are going to make heaven rejoice. Maybe even a choice to follow Jesus today in a way that you've never followed him before. If you've never given your life to Jesus, open up your heart and let him in. It'll be the best thing you can ever do. And so, Father, I just pray that you would come now by your spirit, that you would come in a mighty, mighty way. Have your way in this place. Let prophetic voices rise up, Lord. Let freedom come in this place, Lord God. Let your church rise up. May we be like mighty warriors in the kingdom of God that comes against the enemy, that roars at the enemy and sees Satan defeated in areas of lives. And Father, we do call back the prodigals. We call them back in Jesus' name. They're warriors for you, Lord, that have lost their way. And we call them back. We call back our sons and our daughters and our brothers and our sisters and our mothers and our fathers and our friends and our neighbors. And we call them back in Jesus' name for his glorious, to be part of his glorious army to win the battle for you. And so, Lord, we call them back in Jesus' name. And Father God, we thank you. You are worthy. You are worthy, worthy, worthy. You are worthy of our lives. You are worthy of our praise. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you. Let praise rise up in this place today, Lord. That will shake the very foundations of this building. Because you are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. And we love you. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love your presence. And we pray that you would be glorified in each one of our lives today. Amen.